Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all uh, today. I got a bunch of stuff, as always, including Putin's health, whether Russia will invade Sweden, because people are worried about that, the US stock market, because everybody's worried about that. We'll see how that's going to go and when it will recover, and lots more. But I'm also going to tell you what I found out about these picture things I can do on my vacation because that was really interesting. I didn't imagine for a second that I'd be able to do extra stuff, but now it turns out that I can. Thank you to everybody who commented on the last video for all your welcome backs. That's uh, really remarkable and I'm grateful to the donors. Uh, thank you for that as well. And uh, to all the new subscribers, uh, it's lovely to see you. But uh, speaking of comments, you remember in the last video, I did Teddy Daniels, the Trump guy who wants to be Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, who was in trouble because his wife had got some kind of restraining order against him and he'd left his house. I think that was all resolved in the end, but I did his pictures. And when I did, somebody wrote afterwards and said, forget Teddy Daniels, he's not going to be Lieutenant Governor. My friend Brian Sims is. And I thought, oh, really? Maybe I should check him as well. Brian Sims has been in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives since 2012, apparently. He's a lawyer, a gay activist, and one of his colleagues called the police on him, said, hey, this Brian Sims guy is phoning my home and making abusive phone calls. Uh, well, he's just very, very passionate, apparently, about his activism. So I thought I'd take a look at him because somebody dared me to. And when I went into the energy for Brian Sims, he was in half a rowing boat. So there was only half the boat there, and he was rowing, 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 putting a lot of effort into this, but completely unnecessarily because there was no water. <laughs> What's more, the boat was on a track like you get on a roller coaster, one of the switchback things, and it was moving along anyway. His hat was in the ring. He had to complete the cycle. Ahead of him was a really, really steep climb. And because he only had half a boat, he was hanging on for dear life. A real boat, a whole boat, would have kept him in. But no, <laughs> he was just dangling below it. And when he reached the top, finally, I don't know where the boat went, but he was left sitting at the top of the hill, bewildered. I mean, if this means he wins then it's possible that he doesn't quite know how to resolve certain issues around the election. If he loses, then I'm not sure that's terribly surprising. He only had half a boat. And uh, the steep hill suggested a challenge that uh, sort of defeated him. So if you're the commenter who said, well, my friend Brian Sims is going to be lieutenant governor, you might want to tell him to try harder or build a bigger boat or something. <laughs> I also did pictures for a guy called J.R. Majewski, who is a super MAGA supporter. I think he was at the Capitol on January the 6th, although he says he left before the ugliness started. He is a landscaper. He's a rapper. <laughs> but he's also the Republican candidate for Ohio's 9th Congressional District. He'll be competing in the midterms in November. But what he's really famous for is painting a massive Trump sign on his front lawn that actually tourists travel from other states to go and see. <laughs> he's very, very MAGA. And uh, he could stand a chance of getting into Congress in November. So I had a look at his pictures just to see, because I'm curious. And when I found him, he was quite jaunty, I have to say. Almost like he was leading a parade, marching ahead of the band, full of confidence now that he's won his primary. But as he went ahead, there was chewing gum on the ground. And when he stepped on the chewing gum, it stuck to his feet and it slowed him down. First one foot, then the other foot. So that it became a lot more effort to get where he needed to go. But he is full of determination, like so many of these MAGA people are. It's almost like they've been invested with a mission by some higher authority. He's a QAnon guy. He denies it. But actually, there's tons of evidence that he... Um, is a QAnon supporter. 
And uh, maybe that's his drive, like so many of these people, to get into Congress in November so they can change the government from the inside this time rather than staging uh, a coup on the outside. So he was going along and this chewing gum at every stage slowed him down to the point where he fell over on his face. But his strength is such that he wasn't going to give up at all. Ahead of him, there were all these bars on the ground. And he used his natural strength and determination and intention to pull himself along one bar at a time. And what this told me was, not that I do winning or losing, but that this guy was really, really, really determined to get where he needed to go. You would expect somebody who'd painted a massive Trump sign on their front lawn to be determined anyway. I wonder what happens to these poor people when they realize that they've been scammed by a grifter. What happens at that point? Do they just refuse to believe it all? I don't know. They are in for such a precipitous fall. But anyway, he is the kind of guy who will see it through to the end, I think. Not that he'll win necessarily, but uh, he's certainly got the determination to see it through. J.R. Majewski. This week I saw a trailer for the new Baz Luhrmann movie. Maybe you saw it too. It's like a three-minute trailer for Elvis. He's made a biography of Elvis and Colonel Tom Parker. It looks amazing. So much so. You remember Baz Luhrmann made Moulin Rouge, which I loved. And I thought, maybe I should just take a look and see how this is going to go, because it's coming out next month. And when I found it... There was a brick wall. You know I do these things from the poster, basically, just take the energy from the poster. And when I went into the energy, there was a brick wall. And it was as if somebody had taken a can of paint, it didn't matter what color, but a can of paint, and thrown it against the wall, making a huge splash. And I watched the paint kind of eat away at the wall a bit like acid. But it didn't seem to go through the wall which was odd. So I walked around the other side of the wall and waited. It was very dark back there. And the movie never ate through to the other side. So I don't know. Maybe it doesn't do that well. Maybe it's one of those cult movies that doesn't do great in theatres, but then is on streaming forever or in other formats or whatever. But um, it didn't seem that it did too well initially, uh, which is a shame because I think Baz Luhrmann is terrific. I also looked at the stock market because several people have asked about that. Remember, we are still in that slump that the pictures showed before where it was like a, a baguette, an unbaked baguette, and it just slumped into this ravine. That's where we are. It's still going. And people are very worried. The later pictures I did showed the stock market as a little puppet floating kind of helplessly at the mercy of of outside forces through a very dark passageway or whatever this thing was. And it did seem grim for a while. But then there was a little slope up and eventually it emerged. And all the way along, it seemed like things would work themselves out by the summer. But because people are panicking, I thought I'd take a look again. And when I went into the energy of the US stock market, it was very interesting. There was a drawbridge and the drawbridge was up. And it was up because the little figure, was pushing it up, straining to stop the drawbridge coming down. And behind it, all these, I thought there were people, but they might just have been stocks, perhaps, or something, were just lurking and loitering and waiting for the drawbridge to go down so that they could move ahead. But this little figure was keeping everything in check. Why, I wondered. And when I turned around... There was an enormous and particularly badly drawn boat going by, a ship. It was on wheels, I think. So it was going very, very slowly down this valley. And the drawbridge had to be kept up so that the boat could go by. Now, this could be a lot of stuff. It could be the inflation stuff. It could be Russia and the problem with Ukraine. There are many different aspects to this. But... Gradually, the boat, the ship, whatever this thing was, was going by on its little wheels. And once it had gone, the figure, the man, lowered the drawbridge. And all the little shares or whatever they were ran across the drawbridge and into the future. But it didn't go back up at the rate everybody would hope. 
There was a little lip up, so there might be a bit of a jump. And then things seem to even out for a while. Now, because the stock market is constantly fluctuating, it's very hard for me to do these things miles ahead of time. But it did seem like everything was on hold while this ship went by. And once it went by, the drawbridge could come down and things could start moving ahead. That's what it looked like. It's interesting, actually, that Tesla stock was at about $1,400 or something a few weeks ago. And now it's around the high 600s or low 700s, which is a tragedy. But of course, part of it is due to the slump. Another part is due to Elon Musk and his antics with Twitter. But I thought I'd take a look at that as well. And when I did, you can see that there is the level we were at when I did the pictures. And there's a drop again below it. And that's what happened. It actually dropped from that level. And then it stands there in a sort of dark area, like a basement, and goes, whoa, this isn't good. What are we going to do? Ahead is an elevator. So there is a way out. It climbs into the elevator and starts going up, but then the elevator hits a snag of some kind. It's almost like it should go up to the third floor, but it stops and jolts, and something prevents it going up too high. Now, bear in mind... These pictures can be horribly wrong for stocks, so do not invest <laughs> based on the pictures. It would be a really bad idea. This is just an experiment, just a test. Remember, we're all on board the Titanic. <laughs> Any portfolio in a storm. Anyway, uh, also, I looked at Putin's health. Now, here's a problem with the pictures. For some reason that I don't quite understand, they're not really very good for health issues and never have been. People have said, how's my health going to go? Or how's Mitch McConnell's health going to go? I have no idea. I've been sort of right. If you remember Kathy Griffin, she had lung cancer, poor woman, and has really suffered. Remember, she went through that really, really stressful time when she held up a severed head of Donald Trump and suddenly the FBI were interested in her and the Secret Service and she got into terrible trouble. Her career plummeted. And uh, I wonder whether the stress of that period didn't contribute to her cancer diagnosis. But she had a sister who died of cancer. She had a brother who died of cancer. She was getting better. And when I looked at the pictures, she had this crater ahead of her as though... Yes, she climbed up this hill with people's help and it would be really, really tough. And she thought, well, I'll just go down the other side and everything will be fine. But it wasn't going to be possible. She had to make a massive adjustment now. She might have been expecting to be fully well and operational and going back on the road or whatever. But there seemed to be a period while she walked around the edge of this crater where she had to make massive adjustments to her lifestyle and her career. And sure enough, I think that's what's happened because she posted a video of her going out and she had a high-pitched voice, which I assume is a byproduct of her treatment. I'm feeling good today, so I'm going to go to the premiere of the George Carlin documentary. So things are still evolving on that score. But what the picture said was she is going to have to really take it easy now and play it by ear and gradually emerge into a new version of of her life. And if she pushes it, then it could get really tricky. So those pictures were kind of right, as they were for the Queen, her Madge. She has had a really rough time. Obviously, she had COVID, and that left her terribly weak. And only a few days ago, she had to step down from the state opening of Parliament, something she hasn't done since the 1960s. She takes her responsibilities incredibly seriously. And she just delegated to Prince Charles and Prince William. But if you remember, that's kind of what the pictures said. There was that wall full of buttons. These represented her duties, the jobs she has to do every single day, her commitments. But... Going forward, the buttons were very vague. 
And they led into a mist, and we know that mists are all about uncertainty and not quite sure where to put your feet and so on. And it does look as though she is going to have to step down. If she doesn't actually step down, she needs to step away from a lot of her duties because whatever is happening to her now, and I hope she survives for a very long time, but uh, whatever is happening to her now is uh, part of that whole changeover from the buttons you can push to the buttons that are semi-transparent and grey, to not even knowing whether there are any buttons left. So those pictures came true. However, I regard the health issues in these pictures as extremely spurious. I just do. I've never been confident about them. And so when I came to do Putin's health, I simply did a jotting, actually. Because recently there have been all kinds of rumors flying about him having Parkinson's or thyroid cancer or prostate cancer. Apparently after a parade, he sat uh, with a cushion on his lap, which nobody else was doing, uh, to protect and warm his uh, nether regions. So uh, there's a lot of concern about Putin's health. And doctors have chimed in and said, well, anybody with that kind of face, which is all swollen, whatever, is on chemotherapy. But when I went into Putin's energy, there he is, he was standing with a small trench in the ground behind him, a groove almost. The odd thing about the trench was, the groove, was that he couldn't step behind it. As long as he stayed on this side, he could put up a massive front that all was well. So naturally, I had to take him on the other side to see what that's about. And when I went onto the other side of the groove, it was just a black wall. So on the face of it, things are fine. Behind that groove, things are not fine at all. It's looking very, very bleak. And I think he sees his job as presenting a front where he is invincible. Super strong. Nothing wrong here. I can handle all my duties like the Queen does. I can handle all my duties and running a war and uh, making propaganda broadcasts. I can do it all. I'm absolutely fine. But once he steps behind that groove, he is done and he knows it. So I tried to move him along, and further down the groove, there was a mist, like the Queen had really, of uncertainty, of not quite knowing how to deal with things. So maybe he recovers, but at that point, it doesn't matter what side of the groove he's on. It's almost like we know now that he wasn't well. I mean, if he doesn't survive, then we definitely know things weren't good. <laughs> but it did look as though ahead, there were some really uncertain times. And uh, if he were honest with his people, with the world, then he would confess to uh, some very, very bleak circumstances right now. Not just about Ukraine and all the rest of the stuff going on, but about his health. He really, really doesn't seem to feel very well. I took a look also at the relationship between Russia and Sweden. Because, you know, Russia and Sweden were in a war in the 18th century, I think. And then they signed a peace treaty and all is well. Sweden has never joined NATO. Why? Because they wanted to remain neutral in Russia's eyes. They didn't want to provoke Russia by saying, we're taking a stand with the rest of Europe. And so they just remain neutral. But now, of course, because of the Ukraine situation and Putin making threats against Sweden, they're taking action. Plus... There have been Russian ship maneuvers in the ocean very close by. Uh, Sweden found Russian drones hovering over uh, its nuclear power stations. That was very worrying. And so I thought I'd take a look and see what was happening between Russia and Sweden. And there they are standing side by side. And Sweden just stood there. It was rock solid. You couldn't tell what it was thinking. It wasn't moving. It just retained its composure while Russia went around it, going, I could tweak you, I could pinch you, I could prod and poke you. And Sweden was just going, oh, stop with the threats, you annoying little squirt, and roll its eyes. Do your people not want to be friends of the world rather than constant enemies? What is wrong with you? Russia just giggled. It was just running around going, I can tweak you. I can prod you. It was really, really irritating. But actually, Sweden didn't really respond. I mean, it's put troops on the island of Gotland and stuff. 
<laughs> I didn't know there was an island of Gotland. It's put um, troops on there to protect it, and it's doing what it can. But it's not perturbed in the pictures. It just stood there. And in the end, Russia, which seemed to be looking for relevance or some kind of I don't know, corresponding recognition of its importance, when in fact there really wasn't any, it was diminishing all the time, Russia just in the end went, ah, oh, screw you, and ran off to find somebody else to tweak and prod. It was so juvenile. Once Putin and his silly generals have gone, it could easily be that Russia starts maturing and becoming a part of the global community. That could be a long way down the road, but that's where it's heading. In the meantime, it's in a straitjacket of adolescence and prodding and tweaking and stuff, all completely pointless. And finally, I wanted to tell you about something amazing that happened on my vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Most people will switch off at that point. I don't want to hear about his vacation. But this was about the pictures. This was about energy. And I'll be telling you a series of things over the next uh, couple of videos, maybe the next four or five videos, where uh, I experimented with what my pictures could do. Because before I went on vacation, you may have noticed I was flagging. And I know that a lot of readers on YouTube can do the same subjects over and over and over and over again, and it doesn't seem to bore them. But once I'd done my pictures for various subjects, it's like, do I really need to do them again and again and again? And I was beginning to flag and thinking, maybe after two and a half years, that's it. I don't need to do videos anymore. We've proved the point, I think. But then I went to a museum and they had this picture on the wall painted by Van Gogh as they say, Van Gogh, as Americans say. In 1888, it's the Café Terrace under a starry sky. And it's really fabulous in person. I've actually been to the café itself. They've redone it. It's not the original. They've made it look like the painting, actually. And I thought, I wonder what the energy is around a Van Gogh, Van Gogh painting. And as I looked at this painting, two beams of light came down to one spot. So he put his easel at the end of the cafe and painted it. But what was fascinating was that in the energy of the picture, the spotlights converged over here and he initially was over here, not in the spotlight. And it's almost like being a genius, almost like he was able to go intuitively, no, this isn't right. This isn't where I should be. This is not congruent with the energy I'm feeling. And he moved over into the beams of light. And as I stood in the light, I couldn't see anything else. Everything else disappeared. He had such concentration. When he was focused on what he was doing, the rest of the world just went by. And I saw a wiggly line over here pass me by. And I thought, that could be the energy of somebody running, maybe. Or a horse trotting. That was what went through my head. And as I looked closer at this picture, there is at the very, very back a horse and carriage coming up the street. And I could feel what he was feeling in his focus, just ignoring everything else going on around him, just painting this cafe scene. And I actually felt that the two beams of light represented perhaps his soul's path and his life purpose. I think life purpose and soul's path coincide sometimes or overlap. But the two came together when he was painting in the zone, as artists, writers, and so on say. It was there that the zone was, not over here where he started. And it made me think whether this isn't applicable to all of us. What if for us to flourish in life, we need to be in that spotlight for projects to work, for relationships to work, 
for careers to work. We have to be in that spotlight. The convergence of our soul's path and our life purpose. Or perhaps our intention. Maybe that's another one. But once we are in that spot, we are in line with divine energy. Spiritual inspiration, which is spirit, but spiritual inspiration. We are in that moment and we can all reach it. It's not just about painting or writing or composing music. We all have a zone. But I think because of other things going on around us, we don't step into it. There are too many other concerns in life that we get sidetracked with. And Van Gogh, Van Gogh managed to shut all that out when he did a painting and exist in the moment, in the congruence of his soul's path and his life purpose. After I'd done this painting, I thought, what if I can go into other paintings, other artists' minds and see what they're doing? That sparked a whole adventure. And I'll tell you the results over the coming videos because there are other things as well. But it was absolutely remarkable. This was my entry point. You know what I do? I actually go into cathedrals in cities and large churches and I meditate for about half an hour. And I sat in a cathedral and I said, I don't know what to do with this thing anymore, these pictures. I seem to have hit a dead end. Any guidance you can give me would be very, very welcome. Next day, I went to that museum and saw that painting. And it all flowed out from there. So these pictures can be done for that too. For looking into an artist's mind or a composer's mind. Or viewing how they view their work. Plus a bunch of other stuff which I'll tell you in the coming videos. I was blown away. That is remarkable. Alrighty, so that's it. Um, quite an adventure. And uh, I'm so excited to tell you this stuff. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe if you would. That would be terrific. Like, share, uh, do what you can. It will all be very, very welcome. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Cash Peters. If you want to follow Olive, <laughs> I don't recommend it, really. Uh, if you want to follow Olive, it's at, at, at Olive Meets World. That's it. At Olive Meets World. Otherwise, I will see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.